somewhat dubious honor of being someone who has no title yet. <laughs> but I'm about to become the director for the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies, and so in that role, I welcome you to the college. Uh, it's an especially auspicious occasion for us this evening as we begin our inaugural exchange of theological dialogue between Catholics and Jews. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, uh, welcome to this podium Dr. Arthur Urbano. Thank you, Father Gabriel. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Arthur Urbano, and I teach in the theology department uh, here at Providence College. And it's a great uh, pleasure for me to welcome all of you here this evening uh, to this evening's uh, presentation, which is part of the lecture and colloquium series, Theological Exchange Between Catholics and Jews. Uh, this series seeks to promote interreligious understanding and dialogue by focusing on themes of mutual religious and theological interest in the Catholic and Jewish traditions. Uh, in short, we see this as an opportunity for Catholics and Jews to learn about and from one another. Tonight's lecture is one of three events in the series being held today and tomorrow, focusing on the theme of priesthood. Tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m., Monsignor Paul McPartland will deliver the annual St. Joseph Lecture. Uh, and tomorrow morning, faculty, students, and alumni will have the opportunity to participate in a colloquium with both uh, our, our guests this evening, Rabbi Korn, uh, and Monsignor McPartland for a discussion of their recent research and its bearing on Jewish Catholic dialogue. This evening's presentation by Rabbi Eugene Korn is co-sponsored by the Theology Department and the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies and would not be possible without the generous gifts of donors. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the Diocese of Providence, the Edward and Barbara Feldstein Family Fund of the Jewish Federation of Rhode Island, Judy and Arthur Robbins, and several other anonymous donors. We thank you for your support uh, to the series and to the work uh, of making forums such as this possible. So thank you. Our guest, Rabbi Dr. Eugene Korn, is the North American Director of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation and Director of the Witherspoon Institute's Institute for Theological Inquiry. He served as the Executive Director of the Center for Christian Jewish Understanding at Sacred Heart University and was Director of Interfaith Affairs for the Anti-Defamation League and the American Jewish Congress. He received a doctorate in philosophy from Columbia University and was ordained by the Israeli rabbinate. He's dedicated his career to the areas of Jewish Christian relations and Jewish ethics and law. He has also taught at Yeshiva and Columbia universities. Rabbi Korn is the co-editor of two volumes on interreligious relations, The End of Exile, and Two Faiths, One Covenant. His latest book, The Jewish Connection to Israel, The Promised Land, A Brief Introduction for Christians, is published by Jewish Lights, and there are copies uh, available at the table at the back of the room for anyone uh, who is interested. In his current research, Dr. Korn is considering the significance of the concept of the image of God in the Jewish tradition. In our continuing discussion of the priesthood, Rabbi Korn will speak uh, to us this evening on Israel and the priesthood in Holy Scriptures and today. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Rabbi Dr. Eugene Korn. Thank you very much, Professor Urbano and the theology department and everyone who extended a warm invitation <clears throat> for me to come to uh, Providence College tonight. This is the first time I'm at Providence College, but I confessed to uh, Professor Urbano earlier in the day that actually I have very fond longtime associations with Providence College. See, I was a, always a great fan of the Providence Friars basketball team. See, I remember, uh, I remember one evening way back when I was in undergraduate school in 1966 being at Madison Square Garden. And uh, that was the evening when uh, a Providence basketball player named Jimmy Walker right, played in the NIT. And I was one of 20,000 screaming fans who was hypnotized by Jimmy Walker's artistry and was just shouting for him to score his 50th point in that game. And he did, right? I don't remember who they played. 
I don't even remember who won, but I, I became a great fan of Jimmy Walker and Providence College, and subsequent to that, I followed Ernie D. Gregorio and all the other Providence stars. So I have very fond, warm associations with, um, with Providence. So if I was invited here not to be a coach or a basketball player, um, it's still a wonderful honor to be here uh, and to discuss theology and to be part of the, of the really historic reconciliation between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people. And in particular, uh, it's really wonderful to talk about the priesthood in this day and age, because after all, is there anything in the world less democratic or less egalitarian than the idea of the priesthood? Right. Is there anything more dissonant with contemporary culture than the notion of the priesthood or the institution of the priesthood? But we who are faithful to our traditions, both on the Jewish side and the Catholic side can't just discard something because it's out of sync with contemporary culture. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity to think hard and long about this issue and what it means for us today. Now, I confess at the outset that my primary interest is not in biblical scholarship or in biblical hermeneutics or exegesis, but in theology. And theology built on the foundation of uh, Jewish scriptures and traditional rabbinic thought. And it's not, my interest is not in biblical history or temple history, but in ethics and, and religious ethics and the role that Judaism and Christianity can play in shaping human values today and into the future. So if there are any biblical scholars out there or historians, let me say right now, mea culpa, because I'm not going to satisfy you. Um, I want to talk about a number of things uh, in the Jewish conception of the priesthood. Um, I want to have some initial definitions. I'll talk about the functions of the priest as seen in Jewish scriptures. Um, I'll talk about uh, the priesthood, what happened to the priesthood after the destruction, the, the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE. I want to talk about very specifically this notion of a priestly blessing. And then I'll talk a bit about what I see, the meaning of the priesthood being both for Jews and Christians in contemporary times. Now, Jewish priests, or kohanim in Hebrew, were always central functionaries uh, in divine service and tasks that were mandated in Jewish scriptures. And in particular, part of Jewish scriptures, known as the Pentateuch, which is in rather ugly sounding term, but it means the five books of Moses from Genesis through Deuteronomy. Jews know these sacred scriptures as the Torah. Now Torah really means teaching, but it was tragically translated into Greek as nomos, and then understood pejoratively as law, with a capital L, by the church. For, two, for 1,900 years. But Jews never understood Torah as exclusively law. For Jews, Torah is a combination of ethics and law and narrative. It's not a dry legal code, as portrayed in some polemical literature. But Jews understand this as, understand Torah as a fountain of living waters, which has always sustained Judaism and the Jewish people. Now most of the time the Torah delineates a distinct priests as a distinct separate class within the Jewish people. And it establishes priestly status through paternal heredity. That is, you are a Kohen, you are a priest, if and only if your father was a priest or a Kohen. You know there's a joke about a rather ignorant Jew who comes to a traditional Orthodox rabbi and he says, um, Rabbi, make me a Kohen, make me a priest. And the Orthodox rabbi says, I can't do it, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. And the man says, listen, I, I'm very wealthy, I'll give you a million dollars if you just make me a priest. And the rabbi says, I, I can't do it, 
not for a million dollars, not for two million dollars. So then he tries the next synagogue down the street, and he gets to uh, a, a traditional but a bit more liberal rabbi, and he says, I want you to make me a priest. And he says, I'll give you five million dollars if you'll make me a priest. So the rabbi says, I'm going to research this. Come back tomorrow. I'll, find it, I'll tell you whether I can do it. The next day, rabbi says, I simply can't do it. Then he goes to a very untraditional rabbi, very liberal rabbi, and he says, I'll give you $10 million if you'll make me a priest. So the rabbi goes, poof, you're a priest. <laughs> right? So he gives him the $10 million, and the rabbi says, you're a priest now, but tell me, why did you want to be a priest so badly that you gave me $10 million? And he said, well, my father was a priest, and my grandfather was a priest, <laughs> so I wanted to be a priest too. Okay, so priests were, were a status that one gained through hereditary, through, through um, inheritance. Okay, now priests, or the the notion of priests was a very common notion in all, nearly all Near Eastern and ancient cultures and religions, and it's very clear that the specific Jewish institution of priesthood um, had its basis in the practices of non-Jewish cultures in biblical times. For example, in Genesis chapter 14, we hear of a person named Malchitzedek who was the king of uh, Salem, but who was also a priest. The Torah says, the Jewish scriptures say that he was a priest. Priests were very common. So the Jewish concept of priesthood, in a certain sense, borrowed from the existing cultures around it. And this was an example of the general methodology of Jewish scriptures or of Torah. Jewish scriptures utilize institutions and practices that were common to pagan cultures surrounding the Israelites, but it transforms these institutions. I would say it tries to purify these institutions of their idolatrous and immoral elements before it then mandates or commands these institutions to the Israelite nation. You see, God was a very excellent pedagogue. He understood that in forming the children of Israel, the Israelite nations, the people, the historic people, could not divorce themselves completely from all the cultural norms and the cultural associations around them. So God mandated a new religion for the people of Israel by using old forms, such as the priesthood, but investing them with different norms and different meanings. Now, specifically regarding the priesthood, here's an example of how it transformed the priesthood. The ancient Egyptian priests were seen as having some kind of divine character. And they were also in charge of death rituals in Egypt, embalming, burials. Now this control over death rituals gave them enormous power that led to all sorts of political and spiritual extortion over lay Egyptians. Think about it, how much money would you give to someone who could grant you immortality. Jewish priests, too, had a special holiness, but they were never considered as anything other than human administrators. And they were not permitted to have any contact whatsoever with the dead or with death. Their place was in the temple. And there could be no dead bodies or graves in the temple precinct. If any of you have been to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, not far from Gethsemane, you'll know that there's a cemetery there where Jews were buried because Jews wanted to be very close to the Temple Mount when the Messiah came right? um, because they believed they would be resurrected. But they couldn't bur be buried inside the temple. So they get, they're they buried on the Mount of Olives, which is the closest proximity to the temple. This is a consequence of the law that nothing dead could be within the temple precincts. The priests could have no association or contact whatsoever with the dead. Thus did the Torah succeed in circumscribing the power that the Kohen had over non-priestly Israelites. And if there were more time, I would delineate for you how the biblical institution of slavery was largely purged of its cruel and inhumane elements and became in actuality a very limited form or circumscribed form of servitude, indentured servitude. 
Another example is how the Torah transformed the ancient pagan practice of animal sacrifices right, by limiting, limiting it to prevent the spread of idolatrous worship and ideas within ancient Israel. But let's return to the priesthood. As administrators, Jewish priests are referred to as ministrants of God. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the biblical citations with you, but afterwards, if you wish the biblical references, I'll be happy uh, to point them out to you. They're known as ministrants of God in biblical literature in Isaiah and Jeremiah, right? And is, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel indicates that the purpose of priests is to draw others near to God and worship of the Holy One. In other words, koanim are, are conduits or channels that aided the striving of every Jew to reach God. Now, there's a perennial question amongst biblical scholars of uh, Jewish scriptures. Who qualifies for the priesthood? The entire tribe of Levi? Or only part of this specific tribe? Right? Or every male Israelite? Are all Jews priests in some sense? On this point, there's kind of contradictory texts in the Torah. But how we answer this is very significant. The answer is, I would say, is pregnant with theological and spiritual significance that I want to probe later. Let's talk about the functions of the priests as seen in Jewish scriptures. Priests were mainly concerned with temple ritual in Jerusalem, but not exclusively limited to that. In general, there were four kinds of priestly functions. Temple functions, or cultic functions in the temple, mantic functions, that is functions concerned with solving mysteries and making decisions in uncertain cases through, some, through invoking a revelation of God. That's the second. The third is the treatment of impurities or diseases, such as leprosy, right? That always involves special religious ceremonies. And the fourth major function of priests was judging, teaching, and blessing the people. So I'll go through each of these briefly. The most obvious function of the priests was to offer sacrifices on the altar that stood in the temple court. The priest's activities, activities in this ceremony basically fell into two areas. Number one, sprinkling the sacrificial blood on the altar. And two, burning portions of the sacrifice. These are all spelled out in the book of Leviticus. Why is the book of Leviticus called the book of Leviticus, anybody? What's the root? What does it mean? Levi. Leviticus is from Levi because essentially the book of Leviticus, much of the book of Leviticus is dedicated to the role and the function of the priest, who were Levites. Now, Aaron, the high priest, um, didn't engage in these sacrificial uh, ceremonies that I just described, except when the priests themselves brought sacrifices. Significantly, the high priest plays a central role in the temple ritual on the holiest day of the year for Jews, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. At that day, the high priest is the one who administers the sin offering and who enters the Holy of Holies to ask atonement for the people of Israel. However, atonement comes from God, not from the priest, and only after sincere repentance by the sinners. In other words, the high priest is what we would call today a facilitator, and no more. A second priestly function was to sound trumpets on special occasions, such as pilgrimage festivals or the consecration of the new moon. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, so every new moon is celebrated as a kind of minor festival. The trumpets serve the sacrifices of Israel before God. This is laid out in the book of Numbers. On the atonement day, on Yom Kippur, in the, in the jubilee year, every 50 years there was a jubilee year, it was obligatory to blow a trumpet known as the shofar throughout all the land. And on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, it was obligatory to blow what was known as a memorial trumpet or a memorial blowing. Today, Jews still do blow the shofar 
every year in every synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. However, anyone today can blow the shofar. It is not limited to priests. Another priestly function was to carry the ark that contained the scrolls of the Torah as Israel traveled through the desert before it entered into Eretz Canaan, into the land of, of Canaan. And after it did get into the promised land, it accompanied the ark as it moved around until Jerusalem was established as the, as the center, as the capital, as the place of the temple. Other priestly uh, temple functions included burning frankincense on the altar, setting out showbread on the table altar, caring for the lamps of the altar. Now, if this sounds somewhat reminiscent of church service today, it's not an accident. It was taken very closely from uh, the, how the priests function in biblical times. Now, the second major function, aside from the temple cultic functions, were what, what is known in the trade as mantic functions. Okay. Mantic functions, as I said, were to uh, invoke some kind of uh, ceremony uh, that called the, the revelation of God. So in Numbers, chapter 27, for instance, the high priest consults something known as Urim Vitumim. Urim Vitumim were the stones that were on the breastplate of the high priest. You know, on the way up here, I, I passed this small, relatively unknown college. I came from New Jersey, and I took the train, and I went through New Haven, and evidently there's some small place there. What's it named? Yale, something like that. So if you look at the, if you look at the insignia of Yale University, the, the Latin is lux et a veritas, and there's Hebrew, and the Hebrew is Urim Vitumim, right? Urim Vitumim literally means light and truth. Um, but in this context, it was the stones, there were special stones that the high priest wore, and in certain instances, the, the stones were said to give answers to very difficult questions. So the high priest uh, would enter the Sanctum Sanctorum, or the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the inner, center, inner court of the temple, and uh, pose questions of, of great difficulty. And through some kind of revelation, the stones would, would tell the answer. That's, that's what the uh, biblical text says. But evidently, if we see, look in books like Ezra or Nehemiah, or Nehemiah um, by the second temple period, that whole ceremony and use of Urim Vitumim um, was forgotten and never reinstated. Uh, the, the priests also presided over lotteries. Um, for instance, any, what are the lotteries of the Bible, of, of the Jewish Bible, of what Catholics used to call Old Testament, sometimes they call it First Testament today, sometimes they call it shared scriptures, which I think is the best. So where do we see lotteries in, in, in that portion of the Bible? Anybody know? Well, when Jews came into the land, they had a lottery to determine which tribes would occupy which parts of the land. Okay. Um, what, where else? There was a lottery on Yom Kippur for the scapegoat to determine which of two goats was the scapegoat um, and which would be offered up as the sin offering. That's the second function. The third function was the treatment of impurities or diseases or purification rites. Um, now, in the ancient Near East, generally, diseases and plagues were not simply viewed as organic physiological phenomena, but they were seen as embodiments of inner spiritual defects that came to rest in the body. And healing was performed either by waiting until the impurity left the body or by certain rituals that hastened the end of the impurity. So the Bible uh, instructs that priests are the ones who deal with these purities and impurities like leprosy, for instance. And now, indeed, a prophet could heal leprosy, but only through some miracle, while the priest healed leprosy, or at least presided over its, over its purification ritual uh, in a rather systematic, regular way. Um, now, the fourth function, so, so far we have the temple functions, we have the mantic functions, and we have the purification functions. The fourth function is, is what is most important, I believe, today. And that's that Kohanim also judged and taught people and blessed 
people. So, for instance, in Deuteronomy, there's an injunction for litigants to go up to the chosen city, that is Jerusalem, and be judged there. Uh, and the assumption is that they would be judged both by judges and by priests. Now, the truth is that priests rotated their service in the temple. Um, out of the 12-month calendar year, they served in the temple only three months. And according to ta the Talmud, the other nine months of the year, they functioned primarily as teachers, as theologians, one could say, as teaching the, the word of God to the people. Um, so there's a lot of legal discussion and moral discussion um, that are held before the priests. Now let's talk a bit about um, the function of the Kohanim, or the priest, to offer blessing. The mandate to bless the people occurs on different occasions in a number of places in the Bible, <clears throat> but most prominently, it's found in the imperative in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, which says as follows. Thus says the Lord, talking to Moses, says, talking to the priests. Thus you shall bless the children of Israel. And here is the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So the priests are to invoke my name, says the Lord, upon the Israelites, and I will bless them also. Now, this threefold blessing was recited every morning in the temple. And it's important to stress that the text of the blessing itself indicates that blessings come through the priests, not from the priests. The blessings come from God and from God alone, who's the source of all blessing. The priest is merely a conduit of that divine gift that God bestows upon all of his children. Now, most of the priest's function was in the temple, as I indicated. When the Romans destroyed the temple in the year 70, the temple sacrifices and the purity-impurity rituals, of course, were discontinued. And as a result, the first three functions that I laid out before you, the cultic, the mantic, and the purity-impurity functions of the conium, also came to an end. Now, concurrent with this was a democratization process that was occurring throughout Jewish religious life. The Pharisees, I'm sorry, I thought I turned it off. I was actually at a conference once when the phone rang, and it was the speaker's phone, and he answered it. Uh, so I hope I won't commit the same sin. OK, the Pharisees during this time in the first century, the Pharisees in their tradition, they were not priests. They were not from the priestly line. Okay. They were the people from which Jesus came. And they were the founders of what later became rabbinic Judaism. They de-emphasized hereditary privilege in Jewish society. It was merit, particularly that of Torah scholarship, that eclipsed authority derived from pedigree. There's a famous Pharisaic statement, Mamzer Talmud Chacham Kodem Lekohen Gadol Amaretz. That is, a learned bastard takes priority over an ignorant high priest. Okay, it doesn't matter who, what family you were born into, right? Even if you were the high priest, if you're an ignoramus, then you have lower standing than someone who is illegitimately born but understands and can teach the word of God. However, so in a certain sense, Judaism then became a much more democratic institution right? and de-emphasized this notion of hereditary, uh, heredity. However, a few priestly functions did continue and have endured until today. The most prominent is this act of the Kohanim continuing to bless the people of Israel. In the diaspora, that is outside of the land of Israel, during every major holiday, 
the koanim of each community rise and cover themselves with their prayer shawls. They spread out their hands like this, and they bless the community with the beautiful blessing of Numbers chapter 6. Again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. And in response to each part of this threefold blessing, the community responds, may it be God's will. And in Israel, the land of Israel, the Kohanim perform this function every week on the Sabbath, in addition to the holidays. And in Jerusalem, the holiest of Jewish places, the priests in the community recite this blessing every day in the morning service. Now, I believe it's precisely this blessing, this priestly blessing, that provides the key to understanding the eternal importance of the priesthood. Indeed, I would contend that it illuminates the entire divine mission of the Jewish people, and perhaps even of Christianity, for God's plan in sacred history. And that's what I'd like to explore with you in the remainder of the time that I have. Now, I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that there's a question amongst biblical scholars as to who is fit precisely for this priestly function. Is it only a particular subset of the Jewish people, that is from the tribe of Levi, those people who were born in the tribe of Levi? Or is it every Israelite, every Jew? And the most important place in the Bible that articulates that all of Israel should be priests is in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. The moment before the giving of the Ten Commandments, the moment of revelation at Sinai. Right? Immediately before God gives the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai, and God and the Jewish people commit themselves to be partners in the covenant, God says to the Jewish people, if you will faithfully obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession amongst all people. All the earth is mine, says the Lord, but you shall be for me a kingdom of priests. Mamlechet Kohanim is the Hebrew, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now let's understand the implications of this really revolutionary idea. If the function of a priest is to bestow God's blessing upon others, the way priests do in the synagogue today, on the community, on the worshipers, the Jewish worshipers, and if all of Israel are supposed to be priests, if the Jewish people are supposed to be a mamlechet konim, a nation of priests, it can only be that the Gentile nations of the world are the ones whom Israel is called upon to bless. Hence, traditional Jewish rabbis, theologians like uh, Ovadia Sforno or Samson Raphael Hirsch, identified the Sinaitic priestly function as the mandate to spread blessing by teaching the entire world about God and divine moral values. Indeed, this universal calling is the very meaning of election at Sinai. It's the very reason for Israel's covenant and religious existence. One early, early 20th century rabbinic authority went so far as to claim that in establishing the covenant with Israel at Sinai, God completed his plan for the creation of the universe that began in Genesis. See, the end of the book of Genesis is not Genesis. The end, of, according to this rabbi, in conceptual terms, the end of the book of Genesis is indeed Exodus chapter 19. The election of Israel is the culmination of creation, but not because Jews are the center of the universe, but because Sinai charged the Jewish people to be teachers of humanity, of all humanity, and instruct all people of God's authority over creation, 
and his rules, his moral rules, for the human social order. In other words, the people of Israel was created for the world, not the world for Israel. Now, the prophet Isaiah expresses this very poetically, very beautifully, in God's name, when he says, quote, I will establish you, the Jewish people, as a covenant of the people for a light of the nations. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness the nations, but God will shine upon you. Nations shall then go by your light, and kings by your illumination. The Jewish nation of priests is to illuminate the entire world. Now this idea is the nexus that explains the spiritual connection between Abraham, who in Jewish tradition is the first Jew, and is also interestingly identified by many rabbinic sources as a kind of priest. This explains the connection between Abraham, the first Jew, and the Jewish people, his descendants, who became obligated in the Mosaic commandments after Revelation at Sinai. Because what does God say to Abraham in Genesis 12? The first real meeting, conversation between God and Abraham. There's confrontation. God's original charge to Abraham is, be a blessing. Through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The nivrechu b'cha kol mishpachot adama is the Hebrew. And what's the content of this blessing that Abraham is supposed to spread through the world, of this light, to use the Isaiah metaphor? Jewish theological tradition understood Abraham to have ass assumed the responsibility to be a witness, to be a witness. Jews don't like to use this term because it's so, it was appropriated by the church. But it's a very, if Isaiah could say it, Orthodox Jews can say it, traditional Jews can say it. If God could say it in Isaiah, through Isaiah's mouth, we shouldn't be hesitant to say it. We, the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, are supposed to be witnesses to God's presence on heaven and earth. And as Genesis 18 teaches about Abraham, Abraham and his descendants are supposed to teach the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice on earth. That is, Abraham and his family and his descendants for eternity, the Jewish people, are tasked with the mission of bringing God's blessing to all of humanity and the divine light of the fundamental moral values of righteousness and justice to every corner of the earth. Now tomorrow, for those of you who hear Monsignor McPartland tomorrow, you will hear from him that the whole church considers herself to have assumed this collective priestly function. This is clear from the first letter of Peter, who stated that the whole church is, quote, a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's in 1 Peter chapter 2. And the idea was reiterated at the Second Vatican Council in the Vatican's document Lumen Gentium, which says, the baptized by regeneration and anointing of the Holy Spirit are consecrated to be a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. The entire church, all baptized people. This, in fact, is a, a very faithful extension of this notion of the Jewish people being a kingdom of priests. Now, an interesting question now occurs to traditional Jews. Can Judaism possibly agree with this claim of priesthood by the church? Doesn't it not inevitably entail conceding that the Jewish people has been superseded by the church as God's chosen people? Doesn't it also entail dropping the fervent Jewish conviction that the Jewish people is still in, lo in living covenant with the creator of heaven and earth? I believe that Judaism can, and even stronger, Judaism should agree with this claim of the church. Even while Jews must insist that they, qua Jews, remain in living covenant with God. So let me explain how to do that. 
it's noteworthy that a number of rabbis and Jewish thinkers in the modern era, all, I might add, quite orthodox, quite traditional, have described the historical influence and mission of Christianity as identical to the mission of Abraham, namely to bring the presence of God and a notion of a divine morality to the world. Here are just two examples of, of this rabbinic opinion. Rabbi Jacob Emden in the 18th century in Germany said as follows, Christians have removed idols from the nation and obligated them in the moral commandments of Noah so that the peoples of the earth would not behave like animals of the field. Christians instilled firmly in the nations of the world moral traits. The goal of Christians and Muslims, by the way, but the goal of Christians is to promote godliness amongst the nations, to make known to the nations that there is a ruler in heaven and on earth. In the 19th century, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch in Germany said as follows, the people in whose midst Jews are now living, he lived in Germany in the 19th century, so who, what people are Jews living amongst? Catholics and Lutherans. Okay. So he's talking about Christians, it's very clear. The people in whose midst the Jews are now living have accepted the Jewish Bible of the Old Testament as a book of divine revelation. They, profe they profess their belief in the God of heaven and earth as proclaimed in the Bible. And they acknowledge the sovereignty of divine providence. Judaism produced an offshoot, that is Christianity, in order to bring to the world which was sunk in idol worship, in violence, in immorality, in the degradation of man, the tidings of the one who resides above. Where would the world be without Christianity as, and, and the influence of Christianity, as these rabbis? And the answer is still steeped in rank idolatry and pagan immorality. So in effect, these rabbis saw Christianity as playing the role in the covenantal calling that God made to Abraham. That he function as a priest and bring blessing to all the nations of the earth. Through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, God says to Abraham. So if this is so, then Jews can view Christians as partners conveying the priestly blessing of divinity and morality to the world. In this conception, Christians and Jews should coexist as two independent, quote, nations of priests, unquote, each working differently toward the same end of God's plan for sacred history. Now, someone mentioned that there was a Hasidic community in Providence, is that right? Notice that none of them are here tonight, okay, because they would be very shocked by this notion. In other words, a, a, tr a traditional Orthodox Jewish rabbi conceding a role that Christianity would have in the Jewish covenant or the Abrahamic covenant. But it's very clear that this is, is the case when you look at it this way. This is, but this is a new claim for Jewish theology. And this notion of coexistence is a relatively new claim for Catholic theology, which until recently had insisted that the church had completely replaced or superseded the Jewish people as the people of God. Now, if we are to be true to the Bible's account of Abraham and God's challenge to him, we have to admit that the Bible doesn't portray Abraham as a theologian. Right? He wasn't teaching at Providence College. Okay. It describes Abraham, the biblical description of Abraham is as a man of faith, as a man of action, as a man of morality. His calling as a priest, therefore, should above all denote a commitment to practical action in sacred human history. And it's precisely today that the practical teachings of Abraham and our priestly calling to the world are particularly urgent. And I'll try to explain why. At the dawn of the 21st century, human beings face awesome and terrifying possibilities. Today, 
we have the tools to improve and protect human life as never before. But we also have the means to destroy all human life and all of God's creation. Civilization stands on the edge of a precipice. Our values, our choices, and our behavior will spell the difference between a future of blessing or a future in which the world descends into its primordial chaos. Standing here in the year 2010, after witnessing the Nazi Holocaust, the numerous genocides that occurred in the 20th century, and the demo democides of the past century, Democides are the, the killing of innocent civilians, estimated by some historians to be close to 200 million innocent civilians were killed as a product of war or ideology, primarily in communist Russia and communist China. Democide, destroy a whole society, a whole population. After witnessing these horrors, naivete on our part, or complacency on our part, are religious sins. The horrors of the 20th century have taught us that there was radical evil then. And the radical evil remains an ever-present possibility for today and for the future. As partners exercising a priestly function, Jews and Christians need to emphasize the ethical imperative to do the right and the good. That must be foremost in our theology and our behavior. We need to understand very deeply that there's no justification for any teleological suspension of the ethical. Whether that end is theological, is political, is financial, or is personal. The moral imperative, as both the Bible and Immanuel Kant taught, must be categorical. So today, Jews and Christians can play an essential role in God's sacred plan for progress in history that I believe indeed is absolutely necessary for the survival of humanity. As partners in Abraham's priestly mission, we're spiritually obligated to heed the divine call of bringing blessing to the world and to be charismatic peoples, that is, message-bearing peoples. We do this together by being a nation, nations of priests, bearing public witness to God and his values. And I'll end with how I see our common testimony. Number one, we must testify that there's a spiritual center to the universe because the world was created by a loving God who's intimately involved in human lives and who yearns to redeem his children. Christians and Jews should be unembarrassed about teaching this truth. As was Abraham, who taught his peers about the God of heaven and earth. Two, as the creator of everything, God is the transcendent authority over all human life. And he establishes the validity of moral values. Moral values are sometimes very difficult to apply. But they are not relative, nor are they mere human conventions. They're intrinsic parts of the universe that are absolutely essential for human flourishing. The fundamental values of righteousness and justice must remain primary in all human endeavor. Three, all persons are created in imago Dei, in the image of God. In Tselem Elohim is the Hebrew way the Bible puts it. Every human being has intrinsic sanctity that derives from this transcendent quality. Therefore, all persons possess inherent dignity and must be, must be treated as such. Because human life has transcendent character,
human worth, human value cannot be measured solely in utilitarian or materialistic terms. And because every person is created in the divine image, any assault on human life is an assault on God that diminishes the divine presence in our world. Moreover, the spiritual essence of each person ensures that individual human life is not merely a process of biological decay towards death, but a journey of spiritual growth toward life. Four, Abraham learned from his trial of the binding of Isaac that God loves human life and abhors death. Thus, Abraham's covenantal children, you and me, must teach that the killing of innocents in the name of God is contrary to God, the God of the Bible. And all forms of religious violence are idolatries that the world must reject. As Abraham defended justice and righteousness before the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, we, his children, are duty-bound to teach social justice and display individual righteousness. Because after all, it was only Abraham's protest to God and his concern for the moral treatment of the innocent people in Sodom and Gomorrah that earned him the privilege to be the father of God's covenantal people. It was only that concern that distinguishes his righteousness from Noah's self-righteousness. Noah didn't care about innocent people being lost in the flood. Didn't argue with God. Abraham argued with God. And lastly, I would say that as faithful Christians and Jews who believe in a messianic history, we must teach the eternal possibility of human progress and moral reform, however difficult and irrational that seems. We must not fall prey to pessimism or nihilism or any kind of Malthusian acceptance of war, of disease, of oppression as permanent features of human destiny. Hope in the possibility of a peaceful humanity is the very meaning of our messianic belief. Now, critical theological differences remain and should always remain between Judaism and Christianity, between Jews and Christians. Yet both of our faiths demand belief in messianic history and action to make our world a place where God can enter. We share the priestly task to bless the world, to make it a better place, where moral values are real, where human affairs reflect a spiritual center, and where every human being is in, every human life is endowed with meaning. The prophet Micah offered a stunning description of that time when history will culminate in the blessings of the messianic era. And here's what Micah says. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the God of Jacob, that he teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. Let all the peoples of the earth beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. But let every man sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make him afraid. Let all the people walk, each in the name of his God, and we shall walk in the name of our God forever and forever. If Christians and Jews work together in this priestly calling and become partners after nearly 2,000 years of theological delegitimization and physical conflict, if that's possible, then peace and harmony is possible between any two peoples in the world. That peace that we could create would be our most powerful witness to God's presence in history and to the fulfillment of our calling to carry God's blessing to the world. Indeed, a holy partnership of this type is the very stuff of which the messianic dream is made. So in closing, I say, may God bless you. And through you, may he bring blessing to all the world. Thank you.
You know, it, it, in, in the book of Exodus, when the Jews are fleeing Egypt and uh, they see the Egyptians are coming after them and behind them and in front of them is the Red Sea. So Moses, the people go to Moses and say, why did you bring us here just to die in the desert? We should have stayed in Egypt. So Moses says, don't worry, I'll ask God. And God says, don't worry, you just stay there. I'm going to split the Red Sea for you. But a rabbinic tradition said, wait a second, human beings can't be so inert and passive. Red, Red Sea didn't split until somebody had enough faith to step into the water for the first time. When he stepped into the water for the first time, then the Red Sea split. So don't be afraid you know, to, to, step, to be the first one to step into the water. Yes, Sandra. Prepare for me to, to take the microphone. Um, actually, I, I found what you were saying extremely interesting, and it's given me a lot to think about. Um, but it raised in my mind a question that I've had for a long time, which is, um, in that scene where God is uh, promising Abraham um, that he will be the father of nations and commands circumcision, um, there's something that I've always found kind of uh, curious, which is God commands him not only to circumcise his own descendants, but also all of the slaves and the people who have been brought into the household. Um, and I've always wondered if there's some uh, meaning about participation in the covenant or, or if you have any insights into that, because obviously they are not ethnically, uh, right. they're not related right. to Abraham and what the significance of that right. is. So first of all, I would say that, let's be careful about language. The Bible does not sleep, speak of slaves there, it speaks of servants. Right. So Eliezer of Damascus was, uh, was the primary servant. Um, I think the notion here is that it's not simply who's in the family. In other words, Abraham was seen as trying to bring all people, because his family was basically very small, not, not even an exact. I mean, when this happens, Sandra, Abraham doesn't even have any children yet. So there is no family. It's just Abraham and his wife, you know, sitting alone in the dark house. Um, so I think the notion that's being conveyed here is that it's not about who's in the family. It's about who can be brought under the wings of the divine presence through uh, acknowledging God and accepting God's transcendent moral values. And that, you know, is, is not uh, a hereditary notion. And that's why Abraham was seen as someone who made converts who made converts. That was his priestly calling. Because that happened from the very beginning. I always thought that was very interesting. That seems to support a lot of what you're saying. The Exodus 19 scene where there to be a, a holy, a, a kingdom of priests, kingdom of and, priests a and a holy, a holy nation. Um, when I teach that to the students, I talk about the things that Jews do that are different from the other nations in the ancient world, like keep Sabbath, honor only one God, the commandments. Uh, and I suppose you understand that as part of your priestly mission is to live the Torah in its fullness uh, before the world, and by that to testify to the world about the one true God. What I'm thinking about is the distinctiveness of Judaism as opposed to, say, Christianity and the, and the, the going yes. the rest of the world. Yes. That somehow that's part, I would, I would think, that's part of your priestly mission in the world too. Is that? Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. I think yeah. amongst the Jewish commentators on that verse, they point out that there's two concepts here. One is to be a nation of priests, which if you accept the interpretation that I gave, it means really to have influence to go out and to be an Abrahamic figure that has influence beyond your own community uh -huh. and to be a holy people. Well, that can be understood in the exact opposite direction. A holy people is a people who's set apart, set apart. who's distinct, yeah. right? And, and the spiritual challenge is to blend those two contrary notions or contradictory mm -hmm. notions into kind of a constructive dialectical balance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll tell you, um, and I mean, the example you gave is very instructive about keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. I can't stay tomorrow to Father McPartland's yeah. afternoon well, session because I have to be home, home for the Sabbath. Sabbath. Yeah. So what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath in Jewish theological
nothing more than behavioral testimony that God created the universe. You know, that's the me that's the theological motif with the theological meaning of the Sabbath. We we live a testimony that we believe God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. So the there are all there are many different as the church has explained very well, they're all, form, they're all different forms of evangelization, mm. right? It doesn't only mean converting people. Yes. Just, yeah. Mother Teresa didn't have to go convert people to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Her life was a testimony, yeah. you know, of her faith. Yeah. Right? People understood God because they looked at this woman and they said, this is, you know, th this is a godly woman. She didn't have to convert people formally. So I think that's, this is the notion within... Mm -hmm within uh, Jewish separatism mm -hmm. also. I'll tell you a very telling story. Uh, when I was at Sacred Heart, uh, the president, Anthony Sinera, came back from a visit to India. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, you know, there's 8 million Catholics in India, but there's, I don't know how many, over a billion non-Catholics in mm -hmm. India. He says, it's very tough to be a minority people. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, tell me about tell it. Me. <laughs> you know? In other words, what he was concerned was that, that the Catholic institutions of the Catholic community within India as a small minority have to remain distinct. Otherwise, they'll just get swallowed up in uh, gen generic Hindu Indian culture. And that's the problem. That's what Jews have to wrestle with. How can we remain our distinct and faithful to our specific calling and yet not be a ghetto people who's only concerned yes. with ourselves? That's not an easy road to walk, you know, but that's what the, that's what God asks of us. Uh, when uh, the uh, priests even today are blessing the people, they hold their hands in a very odd way with the fingers right. um, uh, spread. Like this. Uh, yes. Right. The, the question is, uh, a, what is the meaning of this? And B, what is the origin of it? And uh, was the origin influenced by other cultures? The Bible itself doesn't give us any indication of this, the way you're supposed to hold your fingers. That's very, very old rabbinic tradition. Um, and it seems that it's all symbolic. And the space between the fingers is supposed to indicate in some metaphorical way the presence of God between the fingers. In other words, what the priests are really doing is, is trying to bring the presence of God and God's blessing to the people in some way. Now, of course, God is not physical in any way for Jews. So therefore, it all has to be understood in the level of, of metaphor or symbolism, not in the literal way. Um, but that seems to be what most rabbis say the meaning of the spread fingers. And by the way, uh, to show you how, how cautious Jewish tradition was about misinterpreting this notion of God being literally between the fingers, the practice now, is, as Jews know who observe this, is that, is that the priests usually put their prayer shawls over their fingers. You can't see their fingers. And there's also a, a practice of not looking at the priests. So, so on the one hand, the symbolism is there, but on the other hand, there were steps taken not to misinterpret the symbolism into uh, trying to see that, well, maybe God is, is resides in a specific physical space. Um, I don't know if it was taken from other cultures. Uh, I'm not a biblical historian. I'm not a, you know, that's not my field of expertise, so I have no information on that. Uh, but it's a very good question. The, if the uh, uh, who was a Jew question is decided by matrilineal descent, how did it develop that the priesthood became patrilineal? Well, in the Bible, right, with the priesthood, in the Bible, I would say all hereditary status comes through the paternal lineage. Um, Example, right? Moses marries this um, 
uh, Ethiop essentially Ethiopian woman, right, a Midianite woman. You know, Moses leaves Egypt. He's fleeing from Paro, who's got a contract out on him. And he spends 60 years in the suburbs, right, tending sheep, having a very nice, comfortable life before he's confronted at the burning bush. So he marries the daughter of the local priest, Midianite priest. Did anyone ever think that Moses' children were not Jews? Of course they were Jews because in the Bible, identity is passed down through the paternal lineage. In Jewish tradition, that changed sometime around the, in the Talmudic period, where not priesthood, not priestly status, but Jewish identity status then became through the maternal lineage. Right? And, and I think the reason is kind of very practical. You always know who the mother is very frequently don't know who the father is. Okay. But the priestly status, the Kohen, was always derived from the father's lineage, not from the mother's. So it changed sometime around the uh, Jewish identity. The notion of Jewish identity changed, some, or the criteria for Jewish identity changed sometime around the Talmudic period. But the, the criteria for priestly status never changed. I was impressed by your description of the common mission of Jews and Christians. It also sounded very, very familiar. I mean, this roughly old-fashioned liberal Protestantism from the same source, no doubt, the, Hebrews, the, the Hebrew prophets. But what seems to have happened is that a lot of people who used to talk that way seem to want to get God, get rid of God as a factor particularly God insofar as he might impose any limits upon us and not simply bless whatever idea we may happen to come out with. Uh, general comments, please, but I'm also interested if you have any ideas how to persuade such people of the error of their ways. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I would say that I know this is a Catholic institution, but not everything that Protestants say is wrong. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that there is this notion of the kind of universality of God that's deep within Jewish scriptures, that we can't only think about ourselves in our own community, that we do have a mission to the world. Um, that, that, that may have turned into a kind of secular messianism you know, in, in modern culture or in certain extreme liberal theological circles. I'm not a partner to that. You know, I, I think the very meaning of accepting God is to accept certain very, very hard limitations of ethics and of ritual. And that's precisely why religion is, is not the most popular item in today's culture. Um, how do you disabuse people of their ways? I don't know. I, I, well, I do know. I, I think the best kind of, you know, I was trained in philosophy. You know, I was trained to, to finely hone logical arguments. So someone once said that logic is the best tool for winning arguments and alienating people. In other words, the real witness, the real witness to the presence of God that people can speak is a committed life of integrity and of purity and of commitment. You know, when people see that, you don't need the debates anymore. You don't need to show the logical fallacies, you know, of people who are going down the wrong road. People understand that. They just, they viscerally, they understand that they see that. So theology is nice, but ultimately what wins the day is being a shining model of uh, being a person of God. That's why I cited the Mother Teresa example before. You know, I don't know what Mother, Mother Teresa is formal theology was, but I knew what her life theology was. And that spoke volumes. And I think that's the way, that's the way you spread the faith, if I can use the, you know, the popular term. I'm wondering if the priest and the rabbi are the same. Well, I, no, they're not the same. You, you mean in a Jewish priest and a, 
and a Jewish rabbi? Is that what you're saying? No, not at all. Um, and this goes, I think, a little bit to the, to the historical development that I talked about um, in the first century and the second century when, century, when what happened was that the religious authority or religious leadership was transferred from the priests who presided over the temple ritual and who got to be priests through hereditary, through paternal, you know, uh, heredity. That authority and that leadership was transferred then to scholars who could have any father, who could even be illegitimately born. That's what this statement said. Jewish society gives a higher honor to a bastard who's a scholar than a high priest who's born into the right family but is an ignoramus. So uh, what happened is that it was this first category of teachers of Torah who became the rabbis. Um, and pr the priestly function, the hereditary status, went into eclipse. So much so that today um, in a f in formal sense, in a ritualistic sense, the only thing that priests do, in an, really in an active way, are, is this blessing that's done on every holiday or every Sabbath or every day if you're living in Jerusalem. Um, uh, but what I tried to say in my remarks is that, there's the, that that's the formal ritualistic conception. There's a larger spiritual conception that's at work. Jewish scriptures, and that is that we should all be priests. We should all see as our religious obligation spreading blessing to the world and teaching the world about God and transcendent morality. So on a literal level, no, rabbis are not priests. But on a spiritual level, I would say that every rabbi should be a priest. Every Jew should be a priest. And I think there is this connection really to this notion of priesthood within Christianity. Is there one more question from the floor? Rabbi, I, yes, ah, uh, Sean. Uh, I noticed with interest when you were describing the functions of the priest, uh, the mantic function. Um, out of kind of curiosity and so on, how would that differ from the prophetic function? And would it be, or could it also be considered, since uh, you're talking about a revelation of God to uh, those who are coming to you and so on, could that be considered part of the teaching function? Well, the mantic functions were very specific ceremonials or rituals. Um, you generally don't see that, in, and, and it was prophetic in the sense, well, in one sense it was administrative, in another sense it was prophetic. For instance, according to biblical law, the decision to go to war, the Jewish king to go to war, depended upon approval from divine revelation that came from the, the stones, the Urim, the Tumim. Now that was a very effective way of preventing people from uh, going to war for illegitimate reasons or unfounded reasons, right? Because essentially a miracle would have to occur and you'd have to hear God's approval. So that, I don't know about you, Father, but that doesn't happen to me too often. So, you know, that was a way of, of really, uh, a way of keeping them honest. Uh, the prophetic function, it's interesting, in the, in the prophets, in the uh, readings of the prophets, you don't see much about priests. Certainly not much that's positive about priests, right? The prophets rail against the corruption of the priesthood and the, and the abuse of religious forms and sacrifices and temple ritual and that kind of thing. Um, so I would say this, that it, in the sense of consulting the stones of the Urim the Tumim, it is prophetic, but it's limited to very, very discrete situations, whereas the prophetic function is a much broader function and it's not limited, to, very few of the prophets were priests. You know, Eli maybe you could say was a priest, but, but the others were not priests. And I think that, that also reflects this notion of a kind of general spiritual democratization 
that anybody you know who had the goods could be a prophet. You didn't have to be born into the right family.